Hello, I'm Natalie Dupree. Today on Natalie Dupree Cooks for Family and Friends, I have some dishes to take the pain out of entertaining after work. For a starter, there's a black bean pate. For the main course, you have a choice between seafood in papillote, in parchment or in foil, or shrimp scampi. Then there's Elizabeth Burris's broccoli salad and a strawberry mousse that finishes the meal on a very light, elegant note. Entertaining in these days doesn't mean a bunch of people in the back of the house helping you get things out to the front, at least not for me. For me, it's doing it myself. And so this is a menu that's geared towards people that either have to fix things at the last minute, like we're going to do with the shrimp scampi, or else people that want to get everything done in advance. And um, that is really one of the things that I really enjoy doing, too. The first thing that we're going to do is a black bean pate. It just has a little cachet and uh, very up to the minute in terms of what people are looking for. Uh, since we're going to have a lot of cream, in, not a lot, but some cream in the dessert, I just thought it would be good to have a little balance here with the black beans. So we have a pound, a pound of dried black beans or four 15-ounce cans of black beans. And then six to eight cups of chicken broth whatever works for it, six to eight cloves of garlic chopped, four to six tablespoons of grated ginger, and the juice of a lemon. Pretty simple ingredient list. And then to garnish it, some chopped green onion tops, or chives, or cilantro, depending on what your favorite one is, and then crackers and lettuce to fluff it up. Of course, you want the crackers to serve it on. Now, uh, first thing that you want to do is to get everything chopped. And uh, I'll just show you that very quickly here. Chop your garlic clove, just give it a smush with your knife, and go back and peel it. And uh, when you hit it like that, it should just peel very easily. And then go back. If you have a food processor, you can drop it on the going blade of the food processor. That works, too. And then go in like this. And then go over like this, if you can. And then down. This is a kind of a large garlic clove. And it really depends on you as to how much garlic you want to add to a recipe and what size you consider one garlic clove. Then you just work your knife like this and the small pieces fall to the bottom. Then go ahead and get yourself some ginger. Now the same thing is true with this. It calls for a lot of grated ginger. But it really depends on the size of the grate that you get. If you get it very finely grated, you're not going to want four tablespoons of it. Bigger pieces take up uh, um, less room. It's kind of than if they're really chopped finely. So um, always take those things with a grain of salt, which is also <laughs> a different measure. Now chop your green onion tops. And um, I'm just going to move this over here. I know I've told you but my story, but I think it's a good idea on a wooden board just to write on pencil uh, onions and garlic. And on the other side, write uh, the other sugar and sweets so that you don't get your oniony, garlicky flavor into the ingredients that are not going to be like that. Now here, actually, I'm going to use white, the white part of a green onion later. So I'm going to chop the whole thing. And I'll show you how to do this here. There's the white part first. Try to get your chopping for the entire day through at one time so that you can get your hands cleaned and just combine things. It seems to take a little more time in the beginning, but it's actually worth it. The first thing, of course, you would do would be to be soaking your uh, beans. You would have done that overnight. And I'm going to show you that. And here's the green onions. Now that looks a little skaggy there. We'll just throw, get rid of that and then chop this here. All right. There we are. And those are our green onion tops. And these are not really green onions. They're scallions, but I always call them green onions. That's the way I was brought up. OK. With these lovely beans, you want to kind of pick through them and see if there's any pieces in there that, you, that are stone. Sometimes you might even find a stone in there, uh, but anything really hard and un uh, that doesn't look just exactly right, so you can just pick out. And then you either put them in water to cover in a big pan, bring them to the boil, and boil them a minute, and let them rest an hour and drain, or else you just cover them with a quantity of, of water and um, let them sit overnight and then drain it. Do whichever one is easier for you. Sometimes it's just easier to throw them on and do that. Uh, then I always drain that liquid off. Uh, some people reuse it. I'm not crazy about reusing it. 
Then you put them in a heavy pan with the chicken broth, and you can see the difference. Let me show you the difference in these that haven't been rehydrated and these that have been. Can you see that? It's pretty, isn't it? Pretty clear difference. So you can see that these are going to cook up a lot faster. And um, I'll go ahead now and add my chicken broth and water to cover. You can use all chicken broth if you want to. Maybe you don't need any water. And check your package directions, too, if you're doing this. Um, this is only for the dry ones. The canned ones you can just use fresh, so it really depends on your timing. Bring them up to the boil. Reduce the heat. Simmer it until it's soft, about one and a half, about one and a half to two hours. It just is up to you. Um, then you remove one and a half cups of the beans and puree them. You can um, puree them in the blender or the food processor. Uh, I've just used a little of the liquid here to get started. I think I'll make a mess if I turn it on. I'll try it, but you can, you can see it's too noisy, too. And then you drain the remaining beans, and you stir this puree, which I have here, into the rest of the beans. Now, you get to make a decision about whether or not you want a chunky pate or whether you want a ref very refined and smooth one. And it's really up to you. You can mash these even more if you'd like. It's really, you know, it's optional. And then you add your garlic, as much garlic as you'd like. And I always start with about half and then taste. And your ginger. And see, this ginger is not chopped too finely or grated too finely. It just, just really is, depends on you as to, as to what your palate is. And you mix it all together. I'm going to make a mess, so I'll just show you the finished one and get off easy. <laughs> and here is your pate already done, shaped, and on your lettuce leaves. You have some pretty crackers here. I'd probably put those a little closer and garnish it with your green onion. And you can make that several days in advance, but always keep beans refrigerated. They're a protein. You know, treat them like you would a chicken. Keep them cool until you're ready for them, um, or keep them refrigerated until you're ready for them. Now onto this wonderful seafood dish. I don't know about you, uh, I find that I'm eating more and more seafood. And um, this particular dish is terrific because it's from the pitting, putting on the Ritz section of my book, which means that it looks real to do. But in fact, the reality is that it's a very simple way of steaming fish where you have some control and where it doesn't get the odor all over the house. So that's why I like it. And you can get everything assembled ahead of time, then pop it into the, from the refrigerator into the oven when your guests are ready to eat, and you don't have any fuss or muss in the kitchen. I've just gotten lazier and lazier about that. Uh, when I rush home and have to cook something at the last minute, I do something like the shrimp scampi. So the first thing you need is four medium flounder fillets. And these uh, flounders are just like people. You can't get them all the same size. So uh, what you have to do is fold over the thin side there, and then look at your dinner plate and decide what size package you want to make whether you want to use aluminum foil or parchment paper, and then cut it accordingly. And you want to not give them too skimpy a serving either, but uh, this is the nice fleshier part of the fish right there, a lot of ways. But this probably is the piece that will suit better. If you want to give somebody, if you know someone's a big eater, you can put two pieces in there because fish is cooked according to the thickness, not according to the uh, weight or the portion. So we've got that. And then you have a half a pound of fresh shrimp, shelled and veined, a half of a pound of sea scallops, two tablespoons of butter, four tablespoons of flour, two cups of fish stock, clam juice or chicken broth, a little lemon juice, two egg yolks lightly beaten, a fourth of a pound of mushrooms, two green onions sliced on the diagonal with the green part saved, two tablespoons of finely chopped parsley. Another fish that you might want to use for this is lemon sole, but actually any, any nice fish that doesn't taste real fishy. You wouldn't want to use mackerel, for instance, unless it was instantly fresh. Um, and do not buy those little funny little crammed up frozen fish fillets for this. You need a nice fish fillet from the fish market that's been filleted for you that looks pretty. Okay, you always want to rinse off your fish before you get started. And they, you, Aim for about a quarter of an inch thick, uh, but if it's a little thicker, it doesn't matter. And a lot of it depends on the size of your shrimps as well. Then you rinse your shrimp and your sea scallops and just put all of that aside. And slice your mushrooms finely. Here's a nice mushroom. <clears throat> because they're gonna, you're going to care about presentation here, 
you want these to have a pretty look to them. So I'm sort of st topping it, standing it on its base here and slicing down. But then you get to a point where it collapses, then put it where it's flat and slice through. And you may not want to use these pieces on top that are not complete pieces. You may want to put them underneath and do that. And then you have to chop your parsley as well. And those are the green onions that I just did earlier in the day. So chop your parsley. And then here's a brown roux for the sauce. And the way that I make the roux, I did it in a large frying pan so that you could really see the color of it and so that you could see how much easier it is. This is a, don't use an iron skillet. This looks iron, but it's not. It's a coated base. Um, you melt your butter, then you add your flour, and you cook it till it's this pretty color. It's um, the color of this, of this pepper grinder or the salt shaker. It's uh, a nice, lovely dark roux, and that gives an enormous amount of flavor to this. So it's, it's you cook it till it's tan. And then you gradually stir in your clam stock or your, or your fish broth. Lots of times the way I make my fish broth is, in fact, I have a funny story to tell you about it, is um, by cooking, um, when I cook fish in water and I flavor it up maybe with an onion and so forth and so on, then I um, save that water and use that as my fish broth. I maybe will boil it down when the shrimp is out to make it right. Now you bring this to the boil, stirring all the time, and you reduce the heat by half, and then you add a little lemon juice and season it to taste with salt and pepper. And then you want to add some egg yolk. And you add this beaten egg yolk. You stir a portion of this into the egg yolk, a more generous portion than what I've got there. That kind of tempers it. And then that means the more that you get this egg yolk uh, warmed up, so to speak, the more liable it is to um, to not break or curdle when it's in your sauce. And if you've got some lumps in it, you can strain it. I'm not going to fool with that now. Uh, that's why I had it covered with plastic wrap so that it wouldn't form a skin. Now what you need to do is to go ahead and put your fish in here and add your fish, put on your scallops and your shrimp. Little sauce goes on there and you can really put that on whenever you want to in your mushrooms. And go ahead and just coat it, nice generous portion. There we go. And a little oil, brush the package with vegetable oil first, if you will. You know, pretend I did that. And then place a filet in the middle or side by side if you're making a large package. And you put all the rest of the things on. A little green onion, I forgot that. And your parsley. It's really nice. I, I want you to get the feeling that you can do this with anything. And then you go ahead and just make your package. Now, this is not my finest hour. I'm not the best package maker. But you kind of fold it over like this. Um, crimp it is what you're doing. And I should have had those two edges exactly right, but I wasn't looking at what I was doing. Uh, or you can top it with a second sheet of paper. You can either do it one way. You can do it, take one piece and fold it over, or you can do two sheets of paper, either way that you want to do it. But you just want to make sure that no juice escapes. Uh, if you want to leave the egg yolk out of that sauce, you may, if you're concerned about egg yolks. But then uh, reduce the liquid or, or thicken it up a little. Make a practice sauce sometime and see how you want to do it, just that the egg yolk rounds it out. Now, you can make it ahead and refrigerate it. Then when you're ready to bake it, you put the packages on an oil baking sheet, and you bake it until the paper browns, about 10 minutes. Uh, if you put it in from the refrigerator, you have to cook it a little bit longer. Then you serve it in the unopened package, and you slit them up at the table. I'll show you that. Or you turn them out onto a serving plate just before serving, and it's very glamorous. You'll like it. This tank of hybrid tilapia fish is in the aqua cell at Epcot Center, part of Walt Disney World. Aquaculture, the production of water plants and animals, is the fastest growing sector of agriculture. These fish thrive in crowded conditions, although here the light water circulation and filtration are carefully controlled. But they are also farmed in such diverse places as Colombia, South America. Those fish are marketed to us by the Calapia Company as St. Peter's Red Calapias, but they're white too. When the fish weigh in at about two pounds, they're collected and served in Epcot Center's restaurants, where they're filleted and skinned before serving by their chef, Rick Pastena.
For nearly a century, Le Creuset's colorful French cookware has been a favorite in kitchens around the world. From its bold finishes and uncompromised quality to its easy to clean materials, the brand's range of iconic products are as easy to use as they are to love. I really love uh, teaching gelatin desserts because I love the way they taste, but also because the techniques are things that intimidate people. And I think once you get it in your mind, you're never afraid again. Let me read you the ingredients for this particular one. This calls for a pint of strawberries, hold, the juice of a lemon, a half a cup of water, two envelopes of gelatin, two eggs, one egg yolk, six tablespoons of sugar, three-fourths of a cup of heavy cream, one and one-half cups of heavy cream, that's divided. You see, part of it's for garnishing and part of it's for putting in the mousse. Four to six strawberries. That's also for the garnish. Now, the first thing that you want to do is to get yourself organized before you even start your dessert. The first thing, so the first thing you do is to oil, just very lightly, say a four-cut ring mold or a charlotte mold, or even you could even use a Pyrex bowl, uh, anything that you're going to shape it in. But get everything organized first. That's the trick. Because if you didn't have this organized, then when everything was at the point of setting, you couldn't move it in so that you could unmold it later. Then the next thing to do is puree your strawberries. And if I hadn't just used it for bean pate, I might puree it in front of you. But when you're thinking through your recipes in the morning, puree your strawberries before you puree your garlic and your, uh, and your beans. You want at least a cup of strawberry puree. Then you set it aside. And you put your lemon juice and your water and your gelatin into a small heat-proof pan. A one-cup metal measure is what I use a lot, or a microwave dish. And actually, I sponge my gelatin. That's what this is called. I do that first all the time, too, rather than waiting. Because you want it to stand at least five minutes and maybe even longer. I'm going to let you see if you can see this. Uh, it re you really want it to stand till it becomes like a sponge. You also get even, even a little bit thicker, but this... Um, this has hot lights on it, and so it's a little bit melted. But you let it sit till it's a sponge. Then, meanwhile, you mix your eggs, <coughs> excuse me, your eggs, and your egg yolk, and your sugar in a heat-proof bowl. You crack this egg in. Always crack it on the counter and then move it. There we go. On a heat-proof bowl. And you beat it over nearly boiling water until the mixture is really light and thick in color. And I frequently will just use an electric mixer, white over here. I wanted you to see this cockamamie kind of a, of a rig here. And also, usually I use um, maybe a, a bowl, a, a heat-proof bowl. I shouldn't name names. A heat-proof bowl uh, because a metal one, glass bowl, a metal one will conduct the heat even faster. But what you want, what you're concerned about always when, you, when people tell you use double boilers, what you're concerned about is the temperature in the top bowl or the top pan, you're not concerned about what's happening down here. So that can boil if you have a real thick bowl, a glass bowl, heat-proof bowl, but it can't boil too hard if you're using metal. Now, you just beat it until it's thick and light in color. You can do it by hand or with an electric mixer. And uh, in my large KitchenAid, there's a little bain marie that goes underneath it. You can pour boiling water into that and then beat it, although this is a small quantity for such a big mixer. Now, you want to whip it until it leaves a light trail. And there you are. I don't know if you can see that. You almost, they always said in school that you should be able to write an M in it. There we go. Now, you remove it from the heat, and you beat it until it's cool. But you don't chill it yet. Your heavy cream should be whipped way before you get started. Mine is. What you're trying to do is to incorporate three things at the same texture. And whipping cream retards the setting of gelatin. So it goes in towards the end so that it won't interfere with the, dissolve, with the gelatin uh, at all. So then you dissolve your gelatin. You put it over low heat. You don't want it to boil because it'll get kind of bitter and it'll even burn, get brown. Or do it in the microwave. That's a fabulous way to do it. And you stir your gelatin right into your egg yolk mixture. Now, this has been sitting a little bit, and it should be a little softer. You want yours soft all the way. You don't want any little globs in it. But I'm going to show you what to do if you've got globs. So you stir your gelatin mixture in. 
And then, let's say you look down and you said, oh my god, I've got globs in my, in my egg yolk mixture. What you could, you could do two things. You could put this whole thing back over the heat now and whisk it until the gelatin was dissolved. Or you could th put it through a strainer and then remelt the gelatin in your cup again. Big deal. You don't have to cry. You don't have to do anything. You might lose a little volume. If you wanted to, you could whip up another egg yolk. Then you add the strawberry puree and whisk that in. And then you place it in a pan of ice water or cold water and you stir it with a rubber spatula until it's at the point of setting. And this will take about mm, five minutes. Then you fold in your whipped cream at that point. So what you're trying to do is to get this to the point where your whipping cream is. And I'll just show you this. How bad could this be? Now, if you have the kind of a life where you can remember to go back to the refrigerator every 15 minutes or so to check on it, you can certain stir it occasionally. You can certainly do that. I just, I can't ever make that work for me because I don't, I don't know, something happens. I get distracted. So do whatever is easiest for you. It doesn't matter. Then you pour it into your already oiled mold. And there it goes. Just as luscious. You're going you're gonna to fold yours in a little bit better. Now, many times you fold in whipping, uh, whipped egg whites into something like this. And you could certainly do that for this. But um, it'll just make it even lighter. But I didn't want to fool with all that today. So here we go. Get every little last bit of goodness out of there yourselves. Then you put it into your mold and you cover it and you chill it until it's set three to four hours or overnight. When you want to turn it out, one of the real tricks is to lightly oil a serving plate. Then you tilt your mousse in, in its mold to catch an air bubble. Actually, this is a, um, has got a lovely bottom here that when I pull this off, it's going to create air and I'm gonna be, it's going to be easy to turn it out. But let me just show you how you would do this. Um, if you didn't have one that would turn out easily, let's say you were doing it in a glass bowl, you would go around here and what you're trying to do is to catch a little air bubble. Let me just see if I've got one. Oh, there we go. See, you're going to catch an air bubble and when you catch an air bubble, it'll turn out very easily. Then you invert it onto your plate and flip it. Give it a swack. Now don't Write me and tell me that you put it into boiling water. I don't want to hear that to unmold it because that might melt your pretty decoration on the top. And what happened here is that part of the strawberry mixture settled. And um, so it needed to be stirred more all the way through. And that's the point. You can see where it layered up here. So you need to stir it all until it's at the point of setting. And let me show you how to solve that. What you do is you pipe rosettes of really stiff whipped cream on it and nobody will notice. What you don't want is to put your dish over ice uh, with the egg yolk mixture before you add your gelatin because the gelatin will run to the bottom of the pan. And it, it heads for cold. Or you can just do little flowers like that. You have a lot of options for how you want to decorate this. And then go ahead here and garnish it with your strawberries. These look kind of shabby. so. I'll probably cut them in some pretty manner like this, maybe make a little, few flowers. I like that one. A little big. It's funny, I miss the small ones. Maybe very quickly, I wanted to take my time with that because I wanted you to really get it, and this is easy. This is shrimp scampi. Very quickly, I'm going to tell you the ingredients. A half a pound of medium shrimp, a fourth of a cup of butter, a fourth of a cup of olive oil, two garlic cloves crushed in salt, two tablespoons of chopped parsley, a dish of cayenne pepper, the juice of a lemon, and then you, I've got my butter and my oil and my garlic heated in a broiler-proof pan. And I'm going to stir in the parsley, the cayenne, the lemon juice. Oop, there's the cayenne. And then just add the shrimp. You can do this all ahead of time and put it in the refrigerator so you don't have to have garlic on your hands. You can do that in the morning. When you're ready for it, you run it into the broiler. Here it is. It is just terrific. I've done something with mine. Here we go. That's not very hard, is it? You can make that. Get it organized, and it's delicious. And serve some crusty French bread. You boil it about five minutes till it's done. You can check it halfway through, because it depends on the size of your things. 
This broccoli salad is simple. All I'm going to do is read you the ingredients because it doesn't require any real effort. One and one half pounds, which is one large bunch of broccoli, one half onion, red onion, chopped, a cup of sunflower seeds, a half a cup of raisins, a cup of sliced fresh mushrooms, a cup of mayonnaise, two tablespoons of red wine vinegar, a little touch of sugar, maybe a fourth of a cup, half a pound of bacon. It's cooked until it's crisp and you crumble it. Then all you do is you just cut your broccoli into small pieces, everything except the very hard end chunks, and you throw together your onion, your, your sunflower seeds, your raisins, your sliced mushrooms, and you mix it all together. You uh, combine the mayonnaise and the red wine vinegar, and uh, then add that to it. You cook your, you've got your bacon cooked and crisp and drained, and you crumble that. And then just before you're ready to serve, maybe about 20 minutes before you're ready to serve, you toss your salad with the bacon and the dressing. You can combine all that about 20 minutes before serving so that you really don't have any last minute fuss or bother at all. It's easy. I like not having to heat up my vegetables at the last minute when I'm entertaining by myself. I probably would have a rice cooked ahead and in a colander ready to serve as well or reheat it in the microwave. And here, is this wonderful fish that I just, I wanted to show you the difference between the aluminum foil and the parchment paper. Isn't it beautiful? Let me just slide it on here and show you how it cuts. Ah, oh, it's so gorgeous. It does collapse fast in the parchment. That's the difference. And here's this. Beautiful. And then here's a perfect gelatin mixture that's been all combined for you. I think you're going to love this very, very special meal. Add a little rice, a little French bread, and what you've got is a terrific make-ahead